Good morning and welcome to Today on Saturday. I'm Tracy Grimshaw. Coming up soon on the program, we'll meet Sheikh Ahmed Didat, the Muslim missionary who chose Good Friday to deliver a message many Christians regard as an affront. First this morning to a story that has scandalised local church leaders this Easter weekend. Sheikh Ahmed Didat is a South African Muslim missionary who's in Australia to deliver a provocative message in his lecture, Easter, a Muslim Viewpoint. In a country that prides itself on the right to free speech, it is not the content of his lecture that's caused a front, it's the timing. Sheikh Didat delivered his speech on the most solemn day of the Christian calendar, Good Friday. Sheikh Didat joined me earlier. Good morning to you. Good morning, ma'am. What's the purpose of your visit to Australia? My purpose is to educate my people, as well as the Christians in this country, in regards to our relationship with Christianity because Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith for its followers to believe in Jesus. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus. See, the bulk of mankind, the non-Muslims, they do not know that in this holy book of ours, the Holy Quran, is enshrined Jesus Christ. That in this vast volume, you know, Muhammad, the so-called author of this book, the Quran. He is mentioned far less time than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ in this book is mentioned 500% more times than Muhammad. But you don't believe that the Christian version of what happened at Easter is that the is, correct version? That is true. What, so what's says, your version? No, no. So he says now, number one, the people don't know that we believe in Jesus as one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe in his miraculous birth which many modern-day Christians, including the bishops of the Anglican Church, they don't believe today, but we believe. We believe that Jesus was the Messiah, translated Christ. And we believe that he gave life back to the dead by God's permission, and he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. And we believe that God took him up, and he's coming back. Now, all this the Christian doesn't know. He only knows that, no, we disagree with what we disagree with. Says now, says now, what is the reason? Why is it that we want to be different? We want to be funny? What makes the Muslim different from the Christian? But you don't believe that Jesus died and was resurrected right, at Easter. Right. So we say the Christian is boasting that on these three days, these eventful days, the passion of Jesus, there were 300 Old Testament prophecies fulfilled on this day. But I'm telling them that the one that got away, you see in fishing, I'm an angler, and when we talk, we talk about the one that got away. The one that got away, the one that was not fulfilled. Now, I am here to educate people about the one that got away. And, and you will upset Christians, though, won't you? You must, I suppose, concede See, that. My motive is to educate. But can I, can I put to you, if we could just concentrate on, on this one particular issue at the moment, yes. can I put to you that it will be considered insensitive by many Christians that you have chosen Easter to come and deliver this message? No, no. Uh, I had no plans whatsoever. Some months ago, they were asking me for a blank slot that I have in my programs. So, so it's a coincidence so it, it, that it's it Easter. Is a, it is unbelievable. It's un that very, my very first major lecture happens to be on Good Friday. Extraordinarily it's unbelievable. It's extraordinary. But coincidences do happen. But now, to me, this is the most appropriate subject for the day. Let's say on Christmas Eve, on, on Christmas Day, the birth of Jesus, we are supposed to celebrate. I'm talking about the passion of Jesus. You know, what happened to him and how he died and then they, they uh, beat him up. No, doesn't make sense. All it right. doesn't make sense. When you talk about Easter at Christmas time, it doesn't make sense. You no. talk about Easter, Easter time. All right, well, let's say at Ramadan, right. the Pope goes to Tehran and right. says, you've got it all wrong. Right, okay. Come. Well, how would he be received? His Pope, His Holiness, yes. Just coincident that you, look, you mentioned his name. 
He has just written a book called Crossing the Threshold of Hope. It had become the world's bestseller in 12 countries immediately on publication. In this, he says, we must have a dialogue with the Muslims. So, suppose it's a coincidence that Ramadan is the occasion when he happens to be in Tehran and we are having a dialogue. He says, now look, you people, man, you're killing yourself, who the Pope is reason with us. He said, you know, you Muslims, you pray five times a day, every day of the year. Then, you know, that whole month of Ramadan, you're going to go to hunger and thirst. Because from before sunrise to sunset, the Muslim, no eating, no drinking, no sniffing, no smoking. So what kind of life are you people leading? Is your God hungry for that? Is your God hungry for your prayers? Is he hungry for your fasting? He says, no. Now, he has a right. He has a right to say, look, there is an easy way. Can I ask you this? Are you expecting trouble on your visit to Australia? Because you, I notice you have two bodyguards in the studio here. No, I, this is the first time in my life. I don't know Australia. You know, this is, is a rough country or like the old cowboy days. I don't know. You know, the cowboys and cooks we see in films. I thought maybe this vast continent... Please, please forgive me. <laughs> please forgive me. As Australia has enshrined in its democracy freedom of no, speech, no, no, Sheikh. I, I don't I think that... I don't know. I, see, I experience it very much. I appreciate it. But, you know, you don't know, so many, you don't know what's going on. Like when I go to America, the West, I don't know. There's a cowboys and cooks are still around you know, the, with the guns ready to, for blazing away. Can I ask you this? Why? Do, do you believe that we must all worship the same God? I mean, we don't all eat the same food, we don't all speak the same language. Why must we all worship the same God? Why isn't there no, room no. for us all to differ? No, no. We can, we, are, we must tolerate each other as points of views, differences. But everybody is aiming to get a consensus. Everybody. The Christian wants the whole world to be Christianized. True or false? Look at the present moment. There are 35,000 crusaders occupied in Africa, raising the dust. Not priests, ministers of the church, but crusaders from America, they want to change the continent. They want to make Africa a Christian continent. In 1977, in Indonesia, there were 6,000 crusaders trying to convert the Indonesians. And they have succeeded so far in converting 15 million Indonesians into Christianity. And by the turn of the century, they want to make Indonesia a Christian nation. Now, this is an aim, a noble aim, from the Christian point of view. Similarly now, since Christianity is a missionary religion, Islam also is a missionary religion. As much as the Christian is out to share his faith with the rest of mankind, we also want to share our faith with the rest of mankind. And Islam, I don't know whether you know, is the fastest growing religion in the world. Okay. In the West, in Britain, there are more Muslims than Methodists. All right, I still think there'd be plenty of people who'd question your timing, but thank you for your time this Please. morning. Please. A controversial South African Muslim missionary visiting Australia has found reason to thank his critics. Sheikh Ahmad Didaj says those who have criticised the timing of his first Australian lecture have done him an enormous favour. One opponent, the head of the Wesley Mission, says an anticipated attack on Christianity on Good Friday is scandalous. As he embarks on his first Australian tour, Sheikh Ahmed Didat says he hopes to educate Muslims about Christianity and Christians about Islam. This is Good Friday. What they're talking about, these things didn't happen. And my proof is from the Bible itself. The timing of the first public rally so on Good Friday at Sydney's Town Hall has created a storm. Can you imagine if Christians hired the Sydney Town Hall to deny that Muhammad was a prophet, to attack the Koran and to disbase Islamic faith in the middle of Ramadan, what would happen? I'll tell you what, I would have to join Selman Rushdie. Tour organisers say they hope Reverend Moyes will meet the Sheikh to discuss the differences between the two religions. But we are not attacking, we just want to explain whether you believe or do not, it is up to you. The Sheikh believes Reverend Moyes has done him a great favour. Look, if he had ignored me, your newspapers and your radios and your TVs would have never known that did that had come and gone. The New South Wales Ecumenical Council declined to comment on this sensitive matter, saying it does not want to inflame the relationship between Christians and Muslims, particularly at this holy time. While the Australian Federation of Islamic Councils welcomes Sheikh Ahmed Didat's visit, but are disappointed that it clashes with their annual congress. 
Plans for a Muslim lecture to be held at the Sydney Town Hall on Good Friday have sparked a religious row. South African Muslim leader Sheikh Ahmed Didat has offered Christian church leaders the chance to join the theological debate. But they've rejected it because the event coincides with one of the holiest days in the Christian calendar. 78-year-old Sheikh Ahmed Didat has taken on religious leaders throughout the world, arguing the teachings of Islam with evangelists like Jimmy Swaggart. We are not taking you know, exception to that because this is, we are not used to the, our names. But it's the timing of his Easter visit that's upset Christian church leaders. The Sheikh has made a booking on Good Friday at no less a venue than the Sydney Town Hall to argue the Islamic view that Jesus was a prophet but not the Son of God. It's out of love and respect that the Christian says Jesus is God. And out of love and respect we say Jesus is not God. But the head of Wesley Mission claims the Sheikh is being insensitive. He is due to speak on Good Friday, the most holy day in the Christian calendar. That is a very offensive approach to Christians. Mr Didat admits the two faiths have fundamental differences, but believes public debate will lead to greater tolerance. In this vast volume, the name Muhammad occurs only five times. Jesus occurs 25 times, 500 percent more times than in Jesus occurs. He is the king of kings. Reverend Moyes has been invited to take the stage with the Sheikh during his Good Friday address. It's an invitation the Reverend has declined. A war of words has erupted this Easter between Sydney's Christian leaders and a visiting Islamic scholar. The Christians are outraged that the Muslim missionary has chosen to hold a public rally today. But this Easter has seen a religious war of words over a visit by a leading South African Islamic missionary. It has Christian leaders hopping mad. What's incensed Christian leaders about the visit of this Islamic scholar, quite apart from the message itself, is the timing of the event. Christians are incensed that Sheikh Ahmed Didat has chosen Good Friday, a Christian festival, to launch his public rally. Could you imagine what would happen if the Christians of the community took the Sydney Town Hall in the middle of Ramadan and started to deride Muhammad and indicate that the Quran is incorrect? But the man at the centre of the storm, Sheikh Ahmed Didat, doesn't know what all the fuss is about. To me, it is childish. By God, it is childish. I don't want to go deeper into that. It's, just, it's no sense. The Catholic and Anglican Easter messages centred on trust, violence and our descent into savagery. Progressively we are becoming an arrogant, ruthless, bullying society and that is not our inheritance. Promoters say he's bigger than television evangelist Billy Graham, capable of pulling crowds of 30,000. He's 78-year-old Sheikh Ahmed Didat, an Islamic scholar who spent almost 40 years travelling the world upholding and defending the Islamic faith. But it's his arrival in Australia during Easter, the most important time in the Christian calendar which has angered church groups while Muslims believe in Jesus Sheikh Ahmed says the Bible is wrong Jesus wasn't crucified this is enshrined in the Quran it's a bona fide belief of the Muslims that Jesus Christ was neither killed nor crucified we believe that God saved him from that ignoble death on the cross that nakedness on the cross God saved him and God took him up today hundreds of Muslim followers gathered in City Hall to hear the Islamic leader speak. But while his Easter visit to Australia has created controversy, Sheikh Ahmed says he's by no means anti-Christian. In fact, he's calling for a better understanding between Muslims and Christians. Let us have a dialogue. Let us talk. But Christian church leaders say they've nothing in common with this man. And I'm not sure that this really represents mainstream Muslim thinking. They're dismayed at the timing of the visit. It's disappointing that uh, you'd choose Holy Saturday to do something like this in a public place. We develop thicker and thicker hides to protect ourselves and as we lose trust we lose hope.
ഹിമിയ <laughs> Mr. Chairman, and my dear brothers and sisters, I am grateful to God Almighty for sparing this old machine to be able to come across the Indian Ocean into a country which my people call Down Under. Yes, I know that's what you said, Down Under. The country Down Under. You know, the globe of the world, you say, this is the country which is Down Under. I, I don't know how you people managed to remain here, I don't know. 
<laughs> you are a people down under. So for the first time in my life, I had the experience of coming to your great country and I enjoyed your hospitality. I'm grateful to your, to your government for granting me a visa and the people that the way have, they have responded to me in every way, making life easy for me. I can never thank them enough and I praise God that may Almighty reward you. Then I have some unique experiences I have had in the last couple of days. When I, in the, in, in, in the uh, Middle Ages, in Europe, they used to say, see Venus and die. Meaning, that's the acme, the greatest thing that you can see is Venus. You know, the city on the waters, the waterways, it's Venus. In Italy, I think it is. Venus. Venus. So see Venus and die. Now I can go back to my country and tell my people, see Sydney and die. No, no. No, this is not just to flatter you, my brothers and sisters. By God, that's not my intention. I have seen something in your country which the biologist and the zoologist can't, can't classify. Something that is neither fish nor fowl, it's not a reptile, it's not a mammal, it's not a bird. <laughs> what is it? What is it? I saw and I glorified God. Because the Quran says when I see something like that, I am to say, فَتَبَارَكَ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِكِينَ So glory to God, the best to create. Here is something that he has created with nobody can classify. And you have it on your doorstep. What is that? Anybody who's got the answer, just please put up your hand. I'll give you this videotape. I want you to tell me you have something here that nobody can classify. Platypus, yes. Give it. Yes, it's a platypus. You know, <laughs> it, it has a bill of a duck. Seems like a duck. Like it lays eggs. That's a bird. But it lives in the water like a fish. And it gives milk to its babies. Imagine. That's a mammal. You know, feeds that little infant with milk. Is it a fish or a fowl or a, or a mammal? What is it? The scientists have not been able to classify. And I say, I glorify God for having seen it. And so many other things I saw in your zoo. Which at every step I said, فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِكِينَ So glory to God, the best to create. فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِكِينَ So glory to God, the best to create. So, I'm going to tell my people, see Sydney and die. It's a beautiful place to visit and die here too. <laughs> Coming to the subject of this evening's talk, as it was advertised, Easter, a Muslim viewpoint. What makes Good Friday good? That's the question in the advertisement. What makes Good Friday good? I want some Christian gentleman or lady to tell me that. And I will present them with this book, this Encyclopedia of Islam, the Holy Quran, 2,000 pages, text translation and commentary. I want to present it to somebody who will give me, I want a Christian, an answer from the Christian. What makes Good Friday good? Because our belief in Jesus Christ sacrificed himself for our sin. Great, great. Uh, I wanted this simpler. I said that Christ died for our sins. But you said that. You said that. In so many words, that is the answer. This is yours. Now I'm told by learned men that in these three critical days of Easter, Good Friday, 
that Saturday and Sunday, these three days, there were 300 prophecies were fulfilled. In the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, 300 Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled. Now the subject this evening is the one that got away. You see, I'm an angler, catfish. And the greatest thrill is in telling people, say, well, I brought these few fishes, you know, for the wife to fry, we enjoy it. But you say, you know, the one that got away, you know, the one that didn't catch, you know, which was such a big <laughs> blob, you know. That, 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 the thrill, you know, the one that got away. So I said, here is the fish that got away. And that fish happens to be a whale, a whale of a fish. You have heard about Jonah and the whale. Who doesn't know? Jonah and the whale. Everybody knows, There's even little children. You know, you know Jonah and the whale. So, but the whale that got away, Jonah's whale got away. You see, the only prophecy made directly by Jesus Christ about what was going to happen. And in that, he gave the example of Jonah. You see, it's a funny nature of man, that when a man of God comes along, to save mankind from, from perdition, mankind has a tendency to put obstacles in their way. They want that man of God to show them a sign, some miracle, some circus tricks. Do something, man, that which I can't do, then I think I'll give you credit that maybe you are a man of God. That is the sickness of man. Instead of listening to the man, what the man is telling you, whether it's good or bad, no, 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 no. I want you to perform some tricks. Can you stand on your head? Hmm? Can you stand on your head? Can you put your legs in the air? What? Can you stand on one hand? No, no, this is what mankind is looking from this man of God. So we find the sickness, it's common in the Holy Bible, in the, in the New Testament, in the Gospel of St. Matthews, we read that when Jesus Christ claimed that he was the Messiah, the anointed one, translated Christ, the Jews were not satisfied with this bona fide. So they came to him. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38, 39, 40. They come to him and they say, Master, to me sarcastically, they were sarcastic. They didn't mean it. Master, in the Hebrew language, Rabbi, Molana, Sheikh. This is what they said. We would have a sign of thee. We want you to show us a miracle to convince us that you are the genuine man of God. This was uncalled for. So Jesus reacts very strongly, very strongly. He said, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it. An evil and adulterous generation. In modern language, I don't use modern terminology for that. You can think as you like. An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it, except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man, meaning himself, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. The only sign, the only miracle I'm giving you about my bona fide is the sign of Jonah. The miracle of Jonah is my miracle. And I'm asking again, what was that sign? If any Christian can tell me that, I have another volume to give away. I want a Christian to answer that. What was that sign? The sign of Jonah. What was that sign? Any Christian, please, put up your hand, put up your hand, and I will call you. Maybe you are right. You might have it at the first shot. Any Christian to tell me what was that sign? The sign of Jonah. Nobody? What? Yes, my son. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Jesus was killed, and after three days, he rose again from the dead. 
you know, the sign of Jonah, which means what the miracle of Jonah, sign means a miracle, not road sign, stop, yield, go, mm -hmm. not road sign. Sign here, in the, in the French Bible, the word is miracle, miracle, that's the right word, in English, miracle, but the English Bible says sign, the French Bible says miracle. Uh, yes, my son, finish that. So, no, we want something that, what was the miracle of Jonah, which he's talking about? Now you, my brother. on to explain what that is. Four Straight, please, brother. Just stand, stand, stand. Because I was, I was looking at the brother behind you uh, when you were talking. I was thinking, I said, how is it that he's able to speak without moving his lips? No, we want an explanation. You say, what was that sign? Not a lecture. A simple. I don't want to interrupt it, because I want the truth to come out. And I thought Mr. Mr. Josh McDowell explained this to you. And most Muslims don't know. No, please, 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 please. My dear brother, please. Look, a simple. Look, look, look. Your, your eye, brother, brother, please listen to me. Listen to me. Look, there was a gentleman, straightforward answer. There was another gentleman, straightforward answer. Now, you bring in, sh wait, 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 listen to me now. You talking about Josh McDowell. Do these people know about Josh McDowell, what you're talking about? So, the scripture, I quoted you the verse, and he said, he said, Je listen, listen to me. Listen to me. I said, Jesus said, my sign is a sign of Jonah. What happened to Jonah is my miracle. His miracle is my miracle. I'm asking, what was that sign? Okay, I shall read it to you again, Mr. Digger. You don't have to read it to me. I know your whole Bible upside down. Please, my brothers and sisters, no, no, we don't want this, we don't want this. You see, for 40 years, 40 years, I have been asking learned men of Christianity, what was that sign? And I have had no answer. No Christian can tell you what was that sign. Please, it's enough. What was that sign? I said, you see, very easy, very easy. You have to go to the book of Jonah. The sign of Jonah, you have to go to the book of Jonah. But it's a bit difficult. You see, the book of Jonah in the Bible is only one page. In a thousand pages to find that one page is difficult. You know, to look for that one page in a thousand pages, it is difficult. But you don't have to go there. If you went to Sunday school, little children, they know the story of Jonah. Jonah and the way. Everybody knows. The Jewish child knows. The Christian child knows. The Muslim child knows. Everybody knows Jonah and the way. In the book of Jonah, we read that God Almighty sends Jonah to the Ninevites, a city called Nineveh, a city of a hundred thousand people in those days, like a great metropolis, like New York or London in those days. So God Almighty commands Jonah, I said, you go to Nineveh and warn the people there to repent in sackcloth and in ashes. Humble themselves before the Lord or I will destroy them. Jonah, instead of going to Nineveh, he's despondent that these materialistic people, the evil and adulterous generation of his, of his time, same like in the time of Jesus is talking to his evil and adulterous generation, Jesus, the evil and adulterous generation of the time of Jonah. 
He said, that, that weak, evil people, they will not listen to me. They'll make a mockery of me. So instead of going to Nineveh, he goes to Joppa. It's modern Jaffa in Israel. Jaffa. Modern Jaffa. And he takes a boat and is running away. At sea there's a storm. And the storm is not subsiding. And according to the superstition of the mariners, that anybody runs away from his master's command, he creates such a turmoil at sea. So they began to question, who can be responsible for this? Jonah realizes that he is the guilty man. Because God Almighty told him to go to Nineveh. And as a prophet of God, he is a soldier of God. He must listen to whatever God tells him. He has no right to be presumptuous. So he's running away. He's running away from his master's job. So he volunteers. He says, look, I'm the guilty man. I'm running away from master's command. And God wants to kill me. And in the process, he's going to sing the boat to kill me. But you innocent people will die. It is better for you that you take me and you throw me overboard. God is after my blood and he'll be satisfied. You people will be safe. These mariners also a fantastic group of people. They say, no, 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 no. Since you entered the boat, we have seen you ever prayerful. Maybe he had that rosary, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You know, he's ever devoted to God. While he was in the boat, he said, no, no, no. You are a good man. You are a godly person. We can't imagine you being guilty of such a crime. We have our own system of discovering right or wrong. And that is called a system of casting lots. It's like tossing the coin. Head or tail. Head or tail. So according to that system, they discovered that Jonah was the guilty man. So they, so they took him and they threw him overboard. The book of Jonah. Take two minutes to read, but you don't have... This is everybody, every child knows this. Every Christian knows this. So they threw him overboard and the storm subsided. Perhaps it was a coincidence, but the storm subsided. I'm asking the question, when they threw Jonah into the sea, was he dead or was he alive? Thank you, thank you, thank you. See, I know sometimes when if you said he was not alive and make you to change, it would have been difficult. So I would have said, if you, before you answered it, I, I said, look, I want to make things easy for you to get the right answer. Because once you get the wrong answer, I have to move heaven and earth to make you to change the position. You know, to convince you that you were wrong. So I would have made things easy for you to get the right answer by telling you that, look, Jonah volunteered. He volunteered. He says, throw me. And a man who volunteers, you don't have to strangle him before throwing. You don't have to break his arm or limb before throwing. No, no, the man volunteers, he says, throw me. Why are you want to kill him? Why are you want to break his jaw? Nothing. So then I would have asked you, was he dead or was he alive? And unanimous, 100% you would have shouted, alive. Because well, so the man volunteered. One who volunteers, you don't, you don't have to maltreat him. Do you? He says, no. So he was alive. Right answer. Right answer. Any child would have answered that. The fish comes and gobbles him. Dead or alive? Alive! Let me hear again from you all. Alive! Yes, yes. From the fish's belly, he prays to God for help. Do dead people pray? Do dead people plead with God, do they? No. So what was he? Dead or alive? Alive. He's alive. He's alive. alive. On the third day, the fish vomits him on the seashore. Dead or alive? Alive. And it is the, the mightiest miracle in the whole Bible. This is the mightiest miracle of all in the Bible. This is a miracle three times over. You see, when you throw a man into a raging sea, he ought to drown. He had to die. If he died, it's not a miracle. A fish comes and gobbles the man. A fish is not a respecter of person. He says, you know, you are Jonah. You are a prophet of God. Tell him, 
<laughs> gently, gently, gently. <laughs> Not fish. No fish will ever do that. <laughs> you know, have a fish gets a bait, you know, big bait, big. I'm going to have a big bite. <laughs> You'll kill the man. If he died by the fish, it's not a miracle. It's not a miracle. If he didn't die, it's a miracle. Heat and suffocation in the whale's belly. Three days and three nights, he ought to die. He ought to die. If he died, it's not a miracle. But he's alive. Third day vomitors, he goes into the sea alive, he comes out alive. Nowhere does he say he died in between and he was resurrected. Nowhere, nowhere. That he died and was resurrected. He's alive, 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 alive. And what did Jesus say? He said, for as Jonah was, so shall the Son of Man be. The miracle of Jonah is that he is alive three times over. When we expect him to be dead. When we expect the man to be dead, he is alive, he is alive, he is alive. Jesus, he said, my miracle is the miracle of Jonah. Now, I am asking the Christians. That Jonah was alive for three days and three nights in the whale's belly. Everybody is agreed. And I'm asking the Christian that Jesus, for the same period of time, was he dead or was he alive? According to your church. According to your church, according to the one, one billion and five hundred million Christians. According to you and me, Jonah was alive for three days and three nights. And Jesus, for three days and three nights, was he dead or was he alive? Dead! He was dead for three days and three nights. I am asking the Englishman, please, sir, tell me in your language, Jonah is alive, Jesus is dead. Is that like Jonah or unlike Jonah in your language? No, 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 this is your language. Look, you people taught me English. The Britisher, the Britisher, he conquered my country, India. He ruled my country, India, for 150 years. And I was born a British subject. And I carry a British passport, 69 year old. A passport which is 69 year old. I'm 78 now. 69 year old passport I got. And I was telling people in London, in the Royal Albert Hall, that I'm more British than most of you. Because, which guy is at that time about 65? I'm a, I got a British passport of 65 years old. How many of you are 65 years old? So I've been a Britisher for 65 years then. I'm a Britisher, got a British passport. And you people taught me English. You people taught me English. So I'm asking the Englishman, in your language, is this like Jonah or unlike Jonah? Unlike Jonah. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. No, thank you. No, thank you, my brother. It's unlike Jonah. So, if he's unlike Jonah, then either he was bluffing the people. No, no, it's Jesus. He is telling he will be like Jonah, and you are telling that he was unlike Jonah. So either he was lying, bluffing, deceiving the people, or you have misunderstood. One of the two. Either he was lying, he was bluffing his way through, or you have misunderstood. Tell me, which is it? Either he was lying, or you have misunderstood. I would say he was not lying. I can't believe that this mighty messenger of God, Jesus Christ, who occupies such a high position in the house of Islam, that he is one of the mightiest messengers of God, we believe. Jesus. We believe in his miraculous birth, which many modern day Christians, including the bishops of the Anglican Church, they don't believe today, but we believe that Jesus Christ was born without a human father. Miracle of God's creation. We believe. We believe that he was the Messiah, the Messiah translated Christ. We believe he gave life back to the dead by Allah's permission. And he healed those born blind and the lepers by Allah's permission. Can't you see? This is our attitude towards this mighty messenger of God. And this mighty messenger of God, Jesus Christ, I don't know if I tell you that his, he, his name occurs in this book of mine, our book, the Quran, 500% more time than the name Muhammad. Did you know that? You Muslims, do you know that the name Jesus occurs in our book? 500% more times. 
than the name Muhammad. Did you know that? Did you know that? Not likely. 500% more time. The Jesus, son of Mary, Ibn Maryam, Isa Ibn Maryam. 500% more times than the name Muhammad. Muhammad is supposed to have written this book. It is alleged that he wrote the book. Amazing. This author himself, he keeps himself out of the book. And he promotes Jesus. Amazing, amazing, amazing book. Just by the way, just by the way, His Holiness the Pope, John Paul II, he has just written a book called Crossing the Threshold of Hope by Pope John Paul II. It became the world's bestseller in 12 countries immediately on publication. In 12 countries it became the world's bestseller. In this book, he has some beautiful things to say about Islam and the Prophet Muhammad. But there is a chapter he has here in the book about Mary, the mother of Jesus. And the title of that chapter is Mother of God. Mother of God. That's the title. The title in the book he calls Mary, the title is Mother of God. And he's talking about having a dialogue. So if I had the opportunity of meeting His Holiness, I would have asked him, Your Holiness, you know, this Mother of God of yours, how many times is she mentioned in your book, the Bible? How many times? And I, I, I believe he's not expected to know that. And there isn't a Christian who can give me now. I give you, if I keep on giving this Quran away, I'd rather give you fifty dollars. Any Christian who can tell me how many times Mary, the mother of Jesus, is mentioned in your book. Fifty dollars. Put up your hand, please. I don't want anybody to shout. Just one second. Get, give, give somebody else a chance if there is. How many times is Mary, the mother of Jesus, mentioned in your Bible? Put up your hand. Be fair to everybody. Anybody? No, let's, let's try. It's just my brother. I said the Christian. I want a Christian to answer that. Please. Give the Christians a chance. Nobody there? Just my brother. No, no. Why are you managing a money, sir, in this, uh, in this missionary? Why is that, sir? Because the money is not involved, sir. Not involved, sir. My dear brother, simple question, simple. No, I was not trying to score any points. I said, how many times, how many times is Mary, the mother of God, your mother of God, Mary, how many times is she mentioned in your book? I said the Pope is not likely to know that. It's not a part of his training. I don't blame him for that. I don't blame him for that. But I'm telling you now, there isn't a Christian born who can give me that offhand. There isn't. My brothers are walking away. They're walking away. Welcome to them. That's a prerogative. Your privilege. You have we are not forced to come and listen. Mm -hmm. If you think it's too too heavy for you, my In, in South Africa, in my country, the African, you say, you know, it's too heavy. It's too heavy. <laughs> it's too heavy. I don't want you to carry the yoke. Mm -hmm. Now, let me tell you, let me tell you. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is mentioned in the first three books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 17 times. You can remember that now. 17 times. And in the next 24 books of the New Testament, once. Total 18. Word Mary occurs in the New Testament 18 times. In this Quran of mine, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is mentioned a hundred percent more times than in your Bible. Can you believe it? Is it believable? Mary, the mother of Jesus, is mentioned in my book 100% more times than in your book. And you think that we are the enemies. <laughs> a 
Actually, 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 32. Actually, 32. It's almost 18 times 2 is 36, this is 32. It's near enough. I said 100% more times. It's like a figure of speech, but 32 times, as against 18. This is the relationship. She, and, and, and there is a chapter, chapter in the Quran, in honor of the name of the mother of Jesus Christ. The name of the chapter is Surah Maryam, meaning chapter Mary. In your Bible, of the Roman Catholic 73 books, Mary is not one of them. In your Protestant Bible, 66 books, Mary is not one of them. You have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul. Mary is not one of them. Admit it is not there. In my book is enshrined Surah Maryam with the greatest respect in honor of the name of the mother of Jesus Christ. There is a chapter in the Quran. And you consider us to be the enemies. No, no, no. Are we trying to be funny? No, no, no. There is a different point of view, and His Holiness the Pope talks about having a dialogue. Talk, man, talk. Learn to talk. Share your ideas. And disagree. You know, argue vehemently. But at the end, he said, well, this is your point of view. This is, I don't, I don't swallow that. I don't accept that. I keep on believing what I believe. But he said, well, I can see your point of view. That is all. That is all that we want. We don't want to convert you just like that. No, no, no. He said, I see your point of view. I see how your mind is working. Okay, that is all. That breeds tolerance. One thing you know, why this Muslim is behaving like that? You know, he passes a butchery with a pork, pig hanging, and he wants to spit. And you're getting offended. He says, you have a right. He says, because your mouth is watering. That pork chops. You're seeing the pork chops, your mouth is watering. And this guy is spitting. And why does he do that? To offend you? No, 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 no. He's programmed. The Muslim is programmed, brainwashed, that this is a filthy, dirty animal. You don't eat it, you don't rear it, you don't touch it, you don't keep it. Well, he's programmed. So he's reacting to his programming. So once you know, you become tolerant. So now I can see why you're spitting. You see, not spitting to spite me. You're not spitting to spite the Christian who's walking with you. No, no, no. This is just happening to you. <laughs> it happens. So this is dialogue. Once you know, you become more tolerant. Even you disagree, but you become more tolerant. Now, the clever Christian tells us that you see this miracle of Jonah. Jesus wasn't talking about dead or alive. He was talking about the time factor. Look, listen. Jesus says, for as Jonah was three days and three nights, in the belly of the way, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. He uses the word three, four times to emphasize is the time, time, time. This is the important thing, the miracle. I said, what is miraculous about the time factor? The miracle is when you expect a person to die and if he doesn't die, that's a miracle. Time, whether you are in prison for three days or three weeks or three months and you come out alive, so what? That's not a miracle. The miracle is when you expect a man to be dead and he's alive. That's a miracle. But he said, no, no, no. Drowning man clutches at straws. And drowning women also do the same. Something to hold on to. Clutching straws. So he says, it's a time factor. I said, all right, let's examine that. Did you fulfill that? He said, yes. How? Again, bankrupt. I'm telling you, I'm talking from experience. Therefore, I'm talking, I said, come, let's have a dialogue. Your bishops and popes, His Holiness the Pope, I said, let's have a dialogue. It's a long story. It's another story, another lecture about dialogue between me and the Pope. It's another story. But I said, come, let's talk. Your bishops and your archbishops, come talk. Talk to me. Argue and debate with me. Let the people listen and let them make up their minds where truth lies. So it's the time factor. So I'm asking, when was he crucified? Good Friday. Good Friday. It's a Friday. What makes Good Friday good? He said, because that Christ died for our sins. When? Friday. Right? Yes, Friday. That's what makes Good Friday good. I said, when was it? In the morning or the afternoon? So the clever man tells me it was in the afternoon. It was about three o'clock that he was put on the cross. And no man is expected to die 
within three hours on the cross. It was supposed to be a slow, excruciating death. That was the purpose. Not for killing a man. The Phoenicians had pride. You know, spearing the man, he died too soon. Drowning the man, he died too soon. Boiling water, boiling oil, died too soon. Mm -hmm. They wanted somebody to die slowly. The guy is lingering on and on. Three days, four days, five days. Times history records, up to six days the guy would be alive on the cross. It was to be a slow lingering death. That was the purpose of crucifixion. But they say he died. Okay. So, before evening they brought it down. And the Bible tells us, the Jews gave him a Jewial, Jewish burial bath. The ghusal, ghusal, we give to the dead. Then they put 100 pound weight of medicants around him. Like we put camphor to the deceased. 100 pounds weight to put that plastering, 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 100 pounds. That's what the Bible says. 100 pounds weight. And they put shroud around him and they put him into a sepulchre. Sepulchre is not a grave. It's not a grave. It is a big roomy chamber. According to Jim Bishop, a Christian author, in his, in his The Day Christ Died, the name of his book, he said that this tomb was five foot wide by seven foot high and by 15 feet deep. It was like a big roomy chamber with a ledge or ledges inside. So they put him into that sepulchre and they put a stone in the opening and they went away and there was a storm, thunderstorm, lightning, earthquake, shh, everybody would enjoy a Roman holiday, everybody runs away home, you don't want to get wet, an earthquake, shh, all these things to chase people away, giving helping hands if they were there to help him, to secure him, to save him, all right. Let's not go into details. So by the time they brought it, the body down, hurry, hurry, hurry. They were in a hurry to put him up. Now in the Bible, this is, and they were in a hurry to bring him down because of the Sabbath. Because on Friday at sunset, it is the Sabbath. Yamusab. It's the night comes first, then the day. Islam, in Islam, night and day. Ramadan starts. See the moon? Night. Ramadan first night. You see the moon? Ramadan starts. You see the moon? Stop fasting. Same thing to the Jews. At sunset, the day changes, not the westerner, 12 midnight. Damn it all, you wait till midnight to see the day is changing, but that's your system. That's your system, 12 midnight. You say now it's 12, 1, 1 a.m., 1 a.m. in the morning. So, right. So they brought the body down and they put the body into the grave, into the sepulchre, sepulchre, not a grave. So, Friday night, He's supposed to be in the grave. Saturday morning, the Bible doesn't say when he came out, Saturday morning he's still supposed to be in the grave. Watch my fingers. No tricks of the hand, in the side of the hand, the, the guy in the circus, you know, the, he's clowning and he's doing this and that and he's deceiving you with his movements of his fingers. Mm -hmm, no, watch, watch here, watch mine. Friday night, he's supposed to be in the grave. Saturday day, he's still supposed to be in the grave. Saturday night, he's still supposed to be in the grave. Sunday morning, the first day of the week, when Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb, the tomb is empty. This is exactly, I'm reading your Bible, word for word, verse for verse. Friday night, he's supposed to be in the grave. Saturday day, he's supposed to be in the grave. Saturday night, he's still supposed to be in the grave. Sunday morning, the first day of the week. Sunday morning, not Monday. Sunday morning, the first day of the week, when Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb, the tomb is empty. So I'm asking, how many days and how many nights? Come, come, look, look. It's very simple. Well, by God, no, if your eyes are not, you're not short-sighted, <laughs> you can see. How many nights and how many days? Huh? Two nights and a day. Look, Friday night. Saturday day, Saturday night, Sunday morning, he's not there. Two nights and a day. What did he say? For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. He said three and three, three and three. What we see is two and one. I want to know from you Christians whether this Two and one and three and three is the same. Hmm. 
Do you know even an Einstein can't help you? No Einstein can help you in this. Look at this man, simple exercise. Two nights and a day. He said three and three. Three and three. He repeats it four times. And he's only giving you two and one. Again, he let you down. Look, there's something wrong. That's what the Muslims trying to tell you. There's something wrong with your reading of this. I'm not saying that your Bible is false. This is wrong. No, 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 no. I don't say that. I said, I don't know. you English people, man, you English speaking people, you gave me your Bible in the King James Version. And I like that English. I liked it. I like it. And now I read that Bible you gave me and I see that is exactly opposite of what you're telling me. Believe me, exactly opposite of what you are trying to tell me, I read it. And that's how I understand. So I'm asking you, is this like Jonah or unlike Jonah? Is this three and three? Is this the same as this? I'm asking you. <laughs> what, I'm trying to be clever, funny. No, that's what I said, look, this is what you are telling me, I read this, this is what I find here. You explain that to me now, you explain that to me. As a Sunday morning, first day of the week, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. So I'm asking, why did she go there? The Bible says, to anoint him. The Hebrew word anoint is masaha. We do also masaha. You know, every Muslim, you make wudu, ablution. And in the ablution, what we do? We wet our hands and what do you call that? Masaha. Masaha means to rub. In Hebrew, masah means to rub, to anoint. <laughs> so I said, why did this woman go there? He says, to anoint him, to rub him. I'm asking, do Jews massage dead bodies after three days? Do they? You Christian, do you massage your dead bodies after three days? No. We are the closest to the Jew, the Muslims, in our ceremonial law. Do we, do we Muslims massage dead bodies after three days? Do we? Then why would a woman go along to find a dead, rotting body after three days? You know, within three hours, this rigor mortis sets in. The hardening of the cells. The decomposition starts taking place. In three days' time, the thing is rotting inside, fermenting inside. Such a rotting body, you go and massage it, falls to pieces. It'll fall to pieces. So what does she want to do? Unless she's looking for a live person. She must be looking for a life person because she was about the only woman besides Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus who had seen the final rites given to Jesus. She was about the only woman. So she knew that she had seen signs of life. If at all if the crucifixion took place, as they say, that she had seen signs of life. That after three days she is returning to give him treatment. She's worried about the stone. That now what am I going to do with the stone? And when she reaches the tomb, pleasantly surprised, she finds the stone was removed. It was already removed. So she looks inside the cave, in the cave, and she finds empty. So she starts to cry. It's an empty climax to what she had expected. Jesus was watching her from wherever he was. Not from heaven, from this earth. You see, this tomb was a privately owned property belonging to Joseph of Arimathea, a very rich, influential Jewish disciple of Jesus who could afford to carve out this big roomy chamber, a sepulchre for himself. Around this sepulchre he had his vegetable garden and his country home, where he went for his holidays, for the weekends with his family. It's not out in the bundu that he was planting wheat and corn for other people's sheep and goats to graze upon. He must have his gardeners, quarters people to look after his garden. This is all the scene. And Jesus is there. He sees this woman. He knows who she is. So he comes up to her from behind. And he finds her weeping. So he said, woman, woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Doesn't he know? Doesn't he know? Of course he knows. Then why does he ask such a silly question? No, no, it's not a silly question. Actually, he's pulling her leg, metaphorically. Not physically, metaphorically. He's pulling her leg. Says, woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, I'm reading, I'm reading your Bible. She, supposing him to be the gardener. I'm asking, why does she suppose he's a gardener? Do resurrected bodies look like gardeners? Huh? That we all, when we are resurrected, at the end of time, everybody wakes up as a gardener. 
So the wife doesn't know that whether this is a husband or father or grandfather, everybody is a gardener. Her son, she doesn't know who's who. Is that how it is? No, the re resurrected bodies will be yours, yourself. Everybody will be able to recognize you. It will be the real you. So why does she suppose as a gardener? I said, because he's disguised as a gardener. Why is he disguised as a gardener? What for? I say, because he's afraid of the Jews. Why is he afraid of the Jews? I say, because he didn't die and he didn't conquer death. Had he died, and if he had conquered death, there's no need to be afraid anymore. Because the resurrected bodies can't die twice. You ask me, who says that? I said, your Bible. Paul says, it is ordained unto all men once to die. And after that, the judgment. You can't die twice. So, if he had conquered death, no need to be afraid. Because nobody can kill him anymore. But he had escaped death by the skin of his teeth. If he gets caught, they'll make doubly sure, the Jews make doubly sure that they kill him. So, he's disguised as a gardener. She's supposing him to be the gardener. Says, sir, if you have taken him hence, tell me, where have you laid him? To rest, to relax, to recuperate. Not where have you buried him? So that I might take him away. I alone, one frail Jewess, carrying away a dead rotting corpse of at least 160 pound, not like me, I'm 200. Not like me, Jesus, you know, sorry, muscular young man, 160 at least, with 100 pounds weight of medical, make him 260. Can you imagine this Jewess carrying this rotting corpse? Like an American superwoman, you know, she could do. I said, take him and carry him and take him where? Bury him as a hood at the grave. To bury, carrying is one thing, 260 pounds. Maybe this superwoman, she can do it. Hmm? But to bury him, she have to dump him in a hole. Does it make sense? She's going to dump him in a hole. Does that make sense? No, no, no. She's talking about that I alone might take him away for treatment, to look after him. Come on, come on. My dear brothers and sisters, look, each and every, everything, every verse, I'm telling you now, I give you 30 different reasons from the Bible that Jesus didn't die, didn't die, didn't. He was alive, he was alive, he was alive. 30 different reasons from the Bible. I have written a book called Crucifixion or Crucifixion. I don't know whether it's available in this country, but you write to me, you should get it. Or in my volume two of the choice, you should get it. I would rather, I can see the enthusiasm among my Christian brethren. I would rather give them the chance to ask questions. And there are two mics available. There's one on this end and on this other end. I want people to queue up, you know, and then we will ask one at a time, one to the right, one to the left. One to the right, one to the left. But give our Christian brothers a preference, that's all. You Muslims also have a right to ask questions, but give our Christian brethren a preference that, to ask questions first. Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you. To start question time, would you please queue along the outside aisle. So once again, I'd ask you all to show your appreciation. Some takbir for Sheikh Didat. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Well, we have a number of people ready to ask questions. I'll hand the microphone over to the Sheikh. Which side do you want to take first? We'll take, because this brother happened to be the first. I, I admire him. I should congratulate him. You were the first man to get up for asking questions. You have the first chance, my brother. Right. Sir, that question I'm going to ask you from the Quran and I will read it in Arabic. So please, for this English spoken, it's very hard to translate it for me. If anybody, he can translate it all by me after my reading. Go ahead. My brother, I make it easy for you. I make it easy for you. I, make, you know, I gave you the Quran already. Yes. No, no, you own the Quran already. Open that Quran 
and read it in Arabic and read it the translation. Look, I gave it to you already. Be fair. Look, I give you time. I give you chance. I, I give you chance. You get that Quran, find that verse, read it in Arabic, and give them the translation. You do that. Yes, my brother. Mr. Dar, Dar. As you know, I am a Christian, and I'm fascinated by the work you are doing. Let me start from the beginning, Mr. Dar. In your Afrikaner's Quran, the one written and printed and revised recently by you and your Islamic Propagation Centre, in South Africa, there are two key verses, Surah 355 and Surah 5120, which talk about Jesus. For example, in Surah 355, the Afrikan is rendered this way, I am causing you to die. Muslims in South Africa have taken you to task over this translation. For you are saying that Jesus did die. In your lectures and books, in fact, The Choice, which is your own book which I had, I, I read about six years ago, and I believe it was around about chapter 10, where you say that Jesus was not nailed, but tied to the cross. My dear brother, my, look, Look, now, 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 you said, look, wait a minute, you lied, you lied against me. You, you, you are, I, look. You lied, you lied against me. More than one lie you uttered already. I'm telling you, you lied against me more than once already. And I will not allow you to continue lying. Now imagine, imagine the man is now, he hears me lecturing in English. He listens to me in English. Right. He listens to me in English and he's talking about an Afrikaans Quran. Afrikaans I don't know. Then he's talking about my book. Yes, my brother. No, no, no. Where is my brother with the Quran? Huh? He fled. You mean he fled? Look. Nature, Allah made it. Allah set him up to answer the question right and get the Quran. Look, look, it's not planned by me. I don't know who the man was. He put up the hand. I said, yes, you, you get, right, gave the right answer. I gave him the Quran. Look at it. Look at the setup. This is how God works. He is the first man to ask question. He wants to read it in Arabic because he's an Arab. Okay. He's entitled to. Now, he wants somebody to translate for him. So why do you do that? I, you got the Quran already. Quran already I presented you with. Go back, sit down while the other guys are busy. Find that verse, find that verse, and you come out and you read the Arabic and you read the translation. Can anything be fairer than that? No. But you see, it's a kind of, I don't know what to say. This spirit that they have, that spirit deserts them. So, out they go. I see the other guy, he was talking about an Afrikaans Quran. I don't know Afrikaans. He's going to quote from there. I said, look, here is a Quran, open it, see the same verse, tell me. He said, in my book, The Choice, he read six years ago, he's a liar, because this book has only come out now. Choice. No, no, lies upon lies. So I said, now look, here's my brother, you talk about the choice, here's the choice. Find that chapter and verse where I said Jesus died, that he was not nailed, but he was tied. Did I say that? 
I am saying these are the Christian theories. One Christian sect of denomination say this, the Jehovah's Witness say that. These are your theories. These are your artists who are drawing these drawings about Jesus being nailed, Jesus being tied up with ropes. That's not mine, so I give you the choice. I said the Jehovah's Witness says no, he was put on a stake, you know, he was, and he was standing like this, no, not like that. And I said, look, these are the choices I'm giving you in my book. The choices I'm giving you in my book. Now you take the choice. What happened? Because it's your Christians are telling me all these variant things about what happened to Jesus. Now he said, I said. I said, no, I didn't say that. You said, I said, it's a choice. I said, here's the choice. Come on, find it and read it to the people. No, the <laughs> man, amazing. Amazing. Yes, my son. Boy, boy. <laughs> First of all, I just want to say you were referring to many of us Caucasians as Englishmen. Um, I've been here for 200 years and I'm Australian, so I'm not an Englishman. That's just one other point there. So I don't freak out too much over that. Uh, second one was. Uh, just, just one second. This might entertain you. You see, me, I'm a brown Englishman. In other words, I speak English. English is my mother tongue. You understand? In other words, I, 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 I dream in English and I swear in English. And, no, no, the, and the psychologists, they say that the language in which you dream and the language in which you swear is your mother tongue. You Indonesian? You say Indonesian? Okay. I say, in what language do you dream? In Dutch? If you're dreaming in Dutch, you know, no, the Dutch ruled you for 300 years. So maybe, you know, you got some Dutch blood in you. So I said, you speak, you, you, you dream in Dutch? He said, yes. And you swear in Dutch? He said, yeah. I said, that's your mother tongue. You are ashamed to say that, but that's your mother Me, me, I dream in English and I swear in English. So English is my mother tongue. So I'm a brown English man. So from that point of view, when I said Englishmen, English-speaking people, whether you are American, I say you are an Englishman, English-speaking person. From the language point of view, I am describing the people, Englishmen. I guess that if you're saying that you're an Englishman, then I must be. No, I'm a brown Englishman. <laughs> right. Um, first of all, just with the... Uh, we were looking tonight at Matthew chapter 12 and the sign of Jonah. And you quite rightly pointed out that, that there were some things in Jonah which are similar to Jesus and some things which are different. Um, for instance, Jesus is crucified while Jonah is thrown in the sea. That, that's different. Uh, there's a very big difference in that Jonah is disobedient and runs away while Jesus is obedient. So that's a fairly big difference. And the other one is Jonah goes to the Gentiles, the, the foreign countries, while uh, Jesus does his ministry within Israel. So there are a few differences. Um, but and, and you quite rightly correct, pointed out that the, the significance with the Jonah event is on time, on the three days. Um, as this, uh, like I read the Bible uh, all the time. I've actually spent part of my holidays. I read the Quran, and so I, I take the scriptures very seriously. But I know that in order to get the full picture of something, you have to read all of it. You have to read the whole book. So I just want to read a bit more of Matthew, where Jesus speaks again about the three days. So this is just, just from uh, this is from a translation of the Bible called the NIV. It's Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, and it says, "From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hand of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life." And so uh, I think when you read all of it, it he's saying that the three days I'm going to die. There are, I've got some other references up here as well as to that, but they're all fairly similar where they talk about Jesus dying. Uh, I just want to know what you say that, because there are many verses in the Bible, I don't know how much time I want to take up here, but where Jesus says, you know, I, I did die. My son, you have to agree with me that what Jesus was talking about, the sign of Jonah, that sign was a miracle. Sign means a miracle. You have to, it's not a road sign. Stop, yield, go. It's not a it's road sign. There were no road signs in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. So he's not talking about road signs. He's talking about a miracle. The Jews want a miracle from him. Not a road sign. So Jesus said, my miracle is that of Jonah. 
And then what the miraculous thing about Jonah is that we expect him to die three times over and he didn't die. You see, if I had a gun and I lose my temper and put six shots through you, to your heart, and it is shattered and you die, is that a miracle? Is that? But those six shots tearing your heart to pieces and you laugh. <laughs> it's a miracle? Yes, yes, that's a miracle, that's a miracle. Six bullets I put through your heart and you still laugh. <laughs> that's a miracle, I'll be terrified of you, do you know that? If that happened, I'll be terrified of you. <laughs> so, Jesus is talking that look, the miracle mine is that of Jonah. What happened to him is going to happen to me. What happened to Jonah? We expect him to die. We expect him to die at every step. If he died, it's not a miracle. Jesus! If what they tell us about him, he also is supposed to die. He is expected to die. If he died, it's not a miracle. If he died, what they did to him and if he died, it's not a miracle. If he didn't die, it's a miracle. So I'm asking, he said, I will be like Jonah. Jonah is alive, you agreed, and Jesus is dead. And that is in your language of the Englishman, it is unlike. In Zulu, I'm asking the Zulus. He said, just like Jonah. So I'm asking the Zulu, is this Jengo Jonah or Ngai Jengo Jonah? Is this like Jonah or unlike Jonah? And they say it's unlike Jonah. I'm asking the Afrikaner, want Suas Jonah. You know, like Jonah, Suas Jonah. I'm asking the Afrikaner, is this Suas Jonah or Ni Suas Jonah? In Arabic, he says, very strong. In Arabic, this statement of Jesus is very, very strong compared to the English. He says, this is the, the Bible is written by the Christian, by the way, not me. Jilun shirirun wa fasikun yatlubu ayatan wa la tuta lahu ayata illa ayata yunan al nabiyu li annahu kama kana yunanu fi batni al huti thalasa tayyamin wa thalasa layalin hakaza the word I was looking for was hakaza just like that so I'm asking the Arab Christian is this hakaza or la hakaza Jesus and Jonah is it hakaza just like that or la hakaza he says, no, it's la hakaza. So, come on, you prove now that this statement is, 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 is a revelation from God. The Holy Ghost inspired Matthew to, to write it down. Then it is proving that Jesus is a, if I was a Jew, I'll never accept Jesus. As a Muslim, I believe in Jesus. As the Messiah, one of the mightiest messengers, as a Muslim. But as a Jew, I said, look, this man was put to the test and he failed again and again, he's failing. According to the test that he himself lays on himself, he is a failure, he is an imposter. And as an imposter, we killed him. I would have said that, if I was a Jew. But as a Muslim, I say I believe that he was a true messenger of God, and you have misunderstood everything. You have misunderstood. May I just say something on that? You are right. If you were to shoot me six times through the heart, right. and I was just still standing here, that would be a miracle. Of course. But if you were to shoot me six times through the heart and I was to die, be buried, and then I came back to life, that would also be a miracle. Right. Right. So it but still can be a miracle. First, first we have to say that you were dead. Yeah. First, first, if, I, if I was shot six times through the heart, I would be dead. That's, no, no, that's what says assume now. Now Jesus, look, three days, three days after his alleged crucifixion, he goes to that upper room where they had the last supper. I'm giving you another proof that the man didn't die. Proof from his own mouth. He goes to that upper room where they had the last supper. And he goes in and he wishes his disciples in the Hebrew language, Shalom Aleichum. Same as Salam Aleichum. We say Salam Aleichum, the Jews say Shalom Aleichum. Mm -hmm. Same. Means peace be unto you. And when he said Shalom Aleichum, his disciples were terrified. I'm reading your John, that the disciples were petrified, terrified. So I'm asking, why would they be terrified? Because when you meet your long lost master, your grandfather, your teacher, your guru, your prophet, your messiah, the Arab and the Jew will embrace one another and that is his way. The Arab and the Jew. <laughs> but instead of doing that, they are terrified. So I'm asking, why were they terrified? So Luke chapter 24, he gives the answer. 
that they were affrighted because they thought he was a spirit. Am I quoting correctly? You people who know the Bible, am I quoting correctly? Yes. Correct me. If I'm misquoting, you must correct me. Yes, yes, I know. I can't afford to make a mistake. I don't know. So I said, why would they think? And they thought, they thought he was a, a spirit. So I'm asking, did he look like a spirit? Did he look like a spirit? And everybody says, no. Then I said, why should they think the man is a spirit when he didn't look like one? The Christian is puzzled. Why would they say that they thought he was a spirit when he didn't look like a spirit? So I said, look, I'll help you. I'll help you. You see the disciples of Jesus, they had heard from hearsay people talking that the master was hanged on the cross. They had heard from hearsay people talking that he had given up the ghost, meaning his spirit had come out, he had died. They had heard from hearsay people talking that now he's dead and buried for three days. All that knowledge was from hearsay people talking. Because Mark chapter 14 verse 50, he tells us that at the most critical juncture in the life of Jesus, all his disciples forsook him and fled. All. So I'm asking the brown Englishman and the white Englishman, Sir, does all mean all in your language? Hmm? Does all, does it mean all in your language? Of course, all means all. <laughs> all means all. So, they were not there. They were not eyewitnesses or your witnesses to the happening. They all had forsook him. That's what the mark tells. Unless he's lying. You tell me he was a lying. His Holy Ghost had deceived him too. He said, all his disciples forsook him and fled. So they were not eyewitnesses or your witnesses to the happenings. So they had heard that man is dead and buried. They expect him to be stinking in his grave. Such a person you see, naturally you are terrified. You see, he must be a ghost, a spook. So Jesus wants to assure them that is not what they are thinking. So he said, Unzuru ila yadayya varijalayya. Behold my hands and my feet. Inni ana huwa, that it is I myself. Hussuli manzuru, he said, handle me and see. For inna ruha laysa lahu lahmun wa izamun. For the spirit has no flesh and bones as you see me have. So again I am talking, my dear brother, you Arab Christian and you English Christians, I said, if I said, look, because I got flesh and bones, I'm not a spirit, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spook, is that what it means in your language? If I got flesh and bones, in that case, I'm not a spirit, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spook. Is that what it means in your language? Of course it does. If you got flesh and bones, you're not a spirit, you're not a ghost, you're not a spook. Anybody. If you got this, then you're not that. In other words, he's telling you that the body that you're seeing is not a translated body, it is not a metamorphosed body, it is not a resurrected body. Because the resurrected bodies get spiritualized. You want to know who says so? I said, you're Paul. You say, who says so? I say, you're Jesus. You want reference? I give them to you. Come, can bring your bishops and your archbishops to come and have a dialogue with me. In, in, in Sydney, I come again by God at my own expense, I will come. Get me a bishop or an archbishop and we have a symposium, not a debate, a symposium. Present your case and let me present our case and let the people go and make the choice. So, he said, handle me and see. Tengokla, tanganku, dan kakiku, inila ku sendiri, jamahla ku dan lihatla, karena hantu tira berdaging dan tulang, seperti yang kamu lihat ada padaku. So they felt him. I'm reading, I'm reading your Bible. And they felt him. And they believed not for joy. It means they were overjoyed and wondered. So what happened, man? We thought the man was dead and buried. So he says, Have you got here anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. And he took it and he ate in the very side to prove what? There is a ghost. Is that how you prove you are a ghost? You are a spook? Huh? You are eating broiled fish and honeycomb. They are feeling you. And they say, no. They wonder, it's a man. I thought the man was dead. He's alive. Hooray. He's alive. And 
eating boiled fish and honey going to prove what? He's a ghost. He's a spook. Man, every verse I can quote you from the Bible, I said, every verse you have misunderstood, my brothers. You Englishmen, you brown Englishmen, and you white Englishmen, whether you call yourself American, you speak English, you are an Englishman. And I want to say, come, talk to me. In English. Talk to me in English. And I show you that each and every verse you have misunderstood. Every verse you have misunderstood, my son. Okay, my son. Thank you, my son. Yes, my son. This is a multilingual service, so if I may, I'll spice things up a bit. Um, I'm of Greek origin, and the Greek word for Easter is the word Pascha, and that means Passover. And that's quite appropriate for Easter, because like the land that was sacrificed in Egypt, which the Israelites sprayed on the door of their houses, to deliver them from Egypt. So Jesus, when he died, the blood which he shed delivered them from deliver, can deliver us from slavery under sin. So, and if this isn't the only Old Testament reference which Jesus uses to say that he will die and rise again from the dead, if I may quote from Isaiah 53, um, Isaiah the prophet says. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, I've quoted three verses there, they're not um, consecutive. Um, you may read the whole chapter if you like, but I just thought that these verses illustrate that Jesus would die as a sacrifice for sin, and that um, not only um, die, but rise again for life, uh, rise again in life. So my question is, why don't you encourage people to read the Bible for themselves rather than emphasising your own books? My son, what you're doing is, you're also suggesting to me what I read and how I should understand. Same thing you're doing to me. And every Christian, when you come and knock at my door, you want me to see the Bible the way you see it. If you got blinkers on, you also want me to put blinkers on to see. That's what you do. That is what you are trying to do to me. So you see, at the outset I said that there are 300 prophecies were fulfilled. But I said the whale, the whale that got away, that whale came from the mouth of Jesus. Jesus spoke about Jonah and the whale. That miracle you, he didn't fulfill. Now man, you bring a thousand prophecies to, to say it was justified, justified. I said the one that Jesus gave himself with his own mouth. Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, 30 and 40. Now I want you to explain that. That the sign he gave, what? That Isaiah, so and so. Mm -hmm, nothing at all. He said, this is the only miracle I'm giving you to the Jews. That what happened to him is going to happen to me. Did that happen? That's all. Did that happen? In a court of law, if a man had made certain utterances, I said, this is the promise he made. Did he fulfill it? Again and again, he is failing according to your explanation. When I say yours, I mean the Christian explanation. He is failing again and again. So, as a Jew, if I was a Jew, I read your book, I said the man was an imposter and he deserved to die. He, if he had escaped that by the skin of his teeth, I said if we can catch him again, we will crucify him a second time. If I was a Jew. According to his own words, he is failing again and again. You justify that or you get your bishop, your Greek bishop. Tell him, if he knows English, he said, look, this man is prepared to come over all the way at his own expense from South Africa to have a dialogue in an open field where we can get 50,000 people. Hmm? And present your case, man. 
the thousands of Muslims will come and listen to your arguments. And of course thousands of Christians will also listen to our arguments. So I want to do that, if you can. Get one of your Greek bishops, you know, because I can see the English speaking bishops are, 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 are shivering, they are jittery. Maybe the Greek, the Greek, you know, the ancient Greece, Greek, he might be bolder. Try, try and get some Greek, Greek bishop. Okay? Okay, my son. It's just, it's just. 300 were fulfilled, I agree. I said the whale that got away, what have you to say to that? That you allow this whale, whale, whale fish to get away out of your net. You are a very unfortunate creature, man. Huh? You, you're going to catch little fish. When you're the whale, you allow such a big thing to get away from your hands. That's what happened. This is what, according to your scripture, Jesus failed again and again to support you. He's not supporting you, he's supporting me. Right. There'll be last two questions. No, finish now. Last two questions, this lady here, and one more from this side, if there is. Only last two questions. You must appreciate that this is an old machine, 78 year old. You know, and I have come across you know, those time barriers, you know, please, you know, have a little mercy on me. Not I'm trying to run away, mm -hmm. but this, after all, the body, there's a limit to what it can take. Last two questions, this lady here and one more. Thank you, my sister, please. I thank you that I have the privilege to be here tonight to listen to you. I haven't read the Quran. You stimulated me. Perhaps I should read the Quran. But I would like to know what you believe with the ascension of Jesus. Do you believe that he actually lived? So then what happened to Jesus if he lived, if he did not die, if he lived? No. The Quranic ayah, the verse that I read to you, the last expression I said was, Bal Rafahullahu ilayhi. But Allah took him up to himself. We Muslims believe that God Almighty took him up, saved him from that ignoble death and nakedness of the cross, because the people on the cross were absolutely naked. They didn't respect you to put a little loincloth around the man. The messenger of God, you say the son of God, naked and bare before the world, you know, flies buzzing around him. It's, no, no, no. God Almighty didn't allow that to happen to his servant. His messenger, Jesus, God saved him and took him up. And I say, he's coming back to just you. He is coming back. To do what? You know, we Muslims, we believe and we claim that Islam is the culmination, the fulfillment of all of God's revelation to me. All true guidance, all guidance is given to us. We don't have to learn anything new from Jesus or Moses or Muhammad anymore. Whatever God wanted to give, He's given it to us. So what does Jesus come and do? I says, no, He's coming along to rectify you. And He's telling you in the Gospel of St. Matthew, He says, many will say to me on that day, in His second coming, on His return, and many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name do many mighty works? They're going to ask Jesus, didn't we do all these things? We build hospitals, you know, orphanages, and we look after, after the aborigines, and we look after the Maoris, uh -huh, and we look after the Indians. Oh, yes, yes, all these things you did. Uh, we educated all these fools, you know, we civilized them, we cultured them, yes, 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 we did all the things. So did we not prophesy in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name do many mighty works? What does Jesus say to that? He said, I never knew you. Depart from me, foot sack, get away, you rubbish, get away. He said, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You are evil doers, you are evil mongers. Amazing. You who are working in the name of Christ, looking after the lepers, looking after orphans, Mother Teresa, wonderful work she's doing, by God I tell you. You know, I, I bow my head down out of respect for her. All the wonderful things you people are doing, the way you look after the animals, you know, animal conservation to preserve life, Whew, fantastic things you are doing, but for human beings as well, what, what you are doing. And that's what you're going to say to Jesus. Didn't we do all these things for you in your name? And he's going to tell you, foot sack, foot sack. I don't know this, this, this Afrikaans word. It means get away. Get away, you rubbish. Like you did to duck. He's going to do that to you. 
Why would he do that to you? When you did all these things for Jesus. Come, come. I am asking the Christians, he's not going to tell the Jews foot sack, he's going to tell the, not going to tell the Muslims foot sack, he's going to tell the Hindus foot sack, he's going to tell you. Why would he tell you foot sack? Get away, you're rubbish, I don't know you. I'm asking the Christians, answer me. You know why? You know why? Because you call him Lord. He is not your Lord, he is not your God. That's the reason. That is the reason. You make him into a God. That's the reason. You did all this? You bloody rubbish. I don't know you. Get away. You're not mine. You don't belong to me. Not to the Muslims. Not to the Hindus. Not to the atheists. But to the Christians. To the Christians. And those who are claiming to be his followers. He's going to tell you, get away, rubbish, get away. I don't know. Because you have made him into a Lord God. When he told you to worship the Father in heaven. He's telling you, come, 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 I'll teach you how to pray, and pray like this, and he puts the words in your mouth. Like a little baby, like a little child, pray like this. Oh, our Father, which I which I in He's the Father, everybody, Oh, Father in heaven, heaven, thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. Where did he say the Father of Jesus Christ in heaven? Oh, Jesus Christ, my Lord in heaven, where? He said, this is how you pray. But you have forgotten that. You're worshipping him instead of worshipping the Father. Therefore he says, fat sack, get away. I don't even know you. Uh, did you say, the lady, the lady, did you say you got the Quran? You have a Quran? Yes, my brother, this will be the last question. Thank you. Dada Ji, I am very passionate about it. All respect you. I want to, I'm not here to pressure with you or fight with you. I want to break it. Thank you. Um, I know you have understood me. I spoke in Hindi and Hindi. Um, the only thing I want to ask you, one small question. Firstly, I'll say that I'll be down to what they got up. My Hindu, beautiful. <laughs> uh, you said uh, uh, that Christ uh, died, uh, lived uh, for one and a half days. According to what I read in the Bible during my school days, was uh, he rose on was it on the third day? He said three days on the third day. He rose on the third day uh, uh, and, uh, and ascended into heaven. Uh, but according to your country, I'm British born, but I'm not Indian, born Indian. According to uh, your country uh, of origin, uh, the people claim that the Christ lived there with them after uh, riding uh, for 15 years or something and built St. Thomas Church uh, or enhanced that, I don't know. Um, what have you, what sort of comments do you have that idea? No, you see. The Christian is not making an issue out of that. That Jesus went to India and he started the St. Thomas's church. St. Thomas did the St. Thomas church. Why would Jesus go and create a St. Thomas church? He was he created a St. Jesus church. It doesn't make sense. You see? But now, be as it may, be as it may, our idea is that look, nobody dies for your sins. Nobody carries your burden for you. You, according to the law of karma, what you do, you pay for. If you have done well, you earn a reward. If you have done evil, you pay the punishment. That is also Islam. You see, that we have to pay for our own sins. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The one that sins will perish. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. The Bible says, son means father Adam. We, the son, we will not pay for what Adam did. Poor Adam, he made a mistake and he paid the full price. He paid the full price. We, his children, will not be questioned. He says, your father Adam, you know what he did? So he, God punishes us for that. He says, no, he won't do that. Neither the son, son bear the iniquity of the father. Ne the father shall not bear the iniquity of the son. Neither shall the son bear the iniquity of the father. God Almighty will not ask Adam. He says, look at your children. 
25 million sodomites. You call them gays, gays in America. Your children, the bloody rubbish. What kind of children have you brought? No, no. God will not ask Adam and he will not ask us what Adam and Eve did. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. That is the law of God. But if the wicked will turn from all the sins that he has committed, means he asks for forgiveness and repents and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. That is Islam. That is Islam. You pay for your sins, I pay for mine. Nobody, nobody pays for anybody's sins. But the Christian believes that he must, somebody must pay for his sins. So he wants to pass the buck on to Jesus. You know, make things easy for himself. He can do what he likes, but Christ paid for it. You know, and J Jimmy Swaggart, he said, the greater the sin, the greater the redemption. If you, what kind of redemption is it? Jesus Christ, I stole somebody's pin, this pin. And Jesus pays for that. For my parking ticket, he pays for that. What has he done? Huh? But for Hitler's sins, on account of him, 40 million people died in the Second World War. If Jesus pays for that, that is something. If he pays for Peter Sutcliffe, he raped and ripped 13 women, and Jesus pays for that, that will be something. Get the idea? The greater the sin, the greater the redemption. What philosophy is this? Well, it's been quite a night. To all those who've had questions to ask and haven't had their answers, our apologies. The Sheikh, as you can imagine at 78 years old, is probably feeling the strain. I know I am. He's a very hard man to keep up with. He has to catch a six o'clock flight tomorrow morning to Brisbane, where he'll be talking to the Christian and Muslim community in Brisbane. His tour takes him across Australia. <laughs> but, well, I might talk for another 25, but I think I might get thrown off the stage. But he will be back. On Tuesday, same time, same place, the topic will be Christ in Islam. I'm sure, Christian and Muslim alike, you found tonight interesting and informative. I know I have. I've had the privilege of hearing him speak on at least three occasions before this and every time I see and learn and hear something new. Before we all go, would you all please show your appreciation once again for the Sheikh.